Hello Rebooters, welcome back to the channel. I've got something a bit different for you today, because at the same time that I'm recording this video, I'm also going to be recording a podcast called Love People Use Things. My friend Matt Frad created and runs this podcast. He is a Catholic apologist. He speaks out against pornography and its harms on the individual and couples and society itself. And he has invited me to become a co-host of this show with him which I'm pretty excited about. So I'll be putting out a couple episodes each month. He'll do a couple episodes each month and etc. So you can either listen and watch here on this channel, or you can go over to lovepeopleusethings.fm. Check out this episode, future episodes, and past episodes that Matt has done. And a lot of them are very much worth listening to. So you should check that out. It'll be content similar to what I already do on this channel. But I'm also going to be inviting some people on for interviews that are heavy hitters in this field and have some insights that I think will be valuable for you. So without any further talk, I'm going to start recording the actual podcast. You got an inside view here. Hello, and welcome to the Love People Use Things podcast. For those of you who are regular listeners, you're probably wondering, who is this voice, and where are the sweet, smooth, soothing Australian tones that you're used to? Well, not to worry. Matt Frad is still your regular host, but he has invited me on to host some episodes for you as well. My name is Noah Church. I am an author. Back in 2014, I wrote the book Whack, Addicted to Internet Porn, an account of my own discovery of how pornography had had a negative impact and influence on me from a young age, and my journey to free myself from that influence and embrace life, real life, away from digital pseudo-satisfaction. In this book, I talk not only about my own journey, but the stories of many others, the neuroscience of how pornography can impact the brain and create addiction, and also a complete guide to recovery for those who are in similar situations and are looking for a way out. It's basically the book that I really needed to read when I was a teenager, but no one had written yet. After that, I started a YouTube channel. You can find me over there, Noah B.E. Church, where I answer questions about pornography addiction and porn-induced sexual dysfunctions, dealing with a porn addiction in a relationship, etc. I interview people, and I also am a public speaker. I've spoken at conferences and colleges about this topic, that's actually how I met Matt, was at the Coalition to End Sexual Exploitation Summit 2016, where we were both speakers. And since then, we've become friends, and now I'm really excited to be here and host some of these episodes for you. So without any further ado, let's get into today's topic, which is, what do porn addicts really need? What do they really need in order to leave porn behind and embrace a full life free from that addiction. As my friend Sean Musel says, it's less about what you take out of your life when you're recovering from an addiction and more about what you add in. So this episode is about what we need to add in in order to fill the holes that we've been trying and failing to fill with our addictions. And I'm going to be talking about porn addicts specifically, but much of this applies to all sorts of addicts, whether it's to a substance or a behavior like gambling. Addiction is a singular disorder, no matter what the object of that addiction is. And we see the same brain changes uh, across addictions and many of the same behaviors as well. So I'll start by bringing us way back to the late 70s, when researcher Bruce Alexander and his cohorts decided to conduct a different sort of experiment on rats in order to better understand the roots of addiction and how humans can start leaving them behind. Prior to this, many of these studies on rats done on the topic of addiction had been done on rats that were confined alone in small cages with little to no entertainment or connection with other rats or anything a healthy rat would have access to in its natural environment. Bruce Alexander and his cohorts decided to build instead what they called Rat Park, which was an expansive enclosure where many rats at a time could live together, surrounded by plenty of toys and fun stimulation, 
and opportunities for food and water and mating. In this enclosure, they had two different water supplies, one that was regular water and one that was laced with morphine, a potentially addictive opioid. What they found was that these rats who had healthy environments and plentiful connection with others of their own kind did not become addicted to the substance they were provided with, where rats who were caged alone with the same options soon became reliant on these substances and addicted in many of the ways we would see a human opioid addict become addicted. The rats who had connection, who had a healthy environment, might try the drug, but they did not become reliant on it, and they seemed to prefer regular old clean water and did not like the psychoactive properties of the morphine. Rats who were caged alone for 65 days and then introduced into this environment soon gave up the drug, even though seemingly they were heavily addicted, having used it every day for the last two months. They showed some signs of withdrawals, but soon got over them and were able to return to healthy, normal rat lives. This all helps to show us that the opposite of addiction is not just sobriety. There are sober addicts. The opposite of addiction, in fact, is connection. It's a healthy, fulfilled, challenging, exciting life. One in which we can wake up in the morning excited to start our day and lay down our head at night proud of what we have done and looking forward to tomorrow. If we are cut off from others and from our purpose and from what makes us actually happy and we're isolated like those rats confined alone in cages and we're given the option of using something that will help us forget about that pain for a little while even if it's temporary and doesn't actually solve our problems there are very few among us who would not choose to soothe that pain in that way but when we build a healthy life when we actually start to fulfill and meet our basic needs as humans, then the holes that were so empty and calling out for some sort of relief that kept us going back again and again to pornography, those will start to be filled in more healthful ways and we can really start to recover and move forward and get distance between us and our porn habits. All of the porn addicts that I've worked with, and I've worked with many at this point, and by addicts, I mean people who recognized the harm porn was wrecking in their lives and promised themselves committed to quit, but found it very difficult or impossible to do so, kept going back to it, kept breaking those promises to themselves, and got caught in this cycle of relapse and addiction. All of those people had started to use porn and had used porn for a long time as an emotional crutch. It wasn't just about being sexually aroused and looking for relief. It wasn't about being curious about what was out there on the internet to be seen. Those were small parts of it, but mostly it had become about looking to escape from whatever in their life, whatever problem, whatever source of pain, Whatever loneliness they held inside, they could use pornography to forget about that for a while. And as they come to rely on porn to deal with their pain, that becomes the habit that they form. And they reinforce that over years. And that becomes wired deep into their brains. That when they're in pain or when they're distressed or anxious or lonely, they can turn to porn to make themselves feel better. Even if, often after using, they feel worse than ever. Because now not only are their problems not solved, but they've wasted time and they've broken their promise to themselves and they've hurt themselves again in a way that they committed to never do. So what does this mean practically for addicts who are looking to recover? Well, like my friend Sean Musel says, recovery is more about what you add into your life than what you remove. So let's start learning about what we really need to add into our lives. Think about what your needs are. When do you feel urges to use pornography the most? How are you feeling in that moment? What causes you pain? What are problems that you know you have to face, but you haven't had the courage to stand up and meet yet? 
Most often, what people are missing has to do with others. We are social creatures. Human beings need each other. We need to feel connected to one another. We need to feel like we're part of a community. One thing that the people I work with often find helps them immensely start to move forward is to find someone in their lives, a trusted friend, a mentor, a loved one, a family member, someone with whom they can share what they're going through. Just the act of opening ourselves up, allowing ourselves to be vulnerable, telling the truth about what we're struggling with can be incredibly powerful in starting to dissolve that shame that we have built up from years of engaging in an activity that we're not proud of, and then perhaps weeks or months or years more of breaking promises to ourselves that we're going to change, that we're going to be better. We have so much fear that if people know who we really are, what we've really done, what we've really struggled with, our real problems, that they won't accept us. But that fear does not reflect reality. The vast majority of people whom I work with who end up telling someone about what they're going through find it to be an immensely positive experience. The person that they tell is grateful for their honesty and admires the courage it takes to be that honest and open and vulnerable and wants to help and still loves them. And that can be such a great feeling. It's like a hundred pounds falling off your shoulders. It lets you breathe again. It lets you start to accept and love yourself again. And having that connection with somebody can really be a great leap forward in getting away from their addiction, breaking out of that cycle of relapse. What else can people do to reinforce a healthy life every day? Well, part of it is bodily health. The mind can only be as healthy as the body is. So starting to focus on living a healthy lifestyle, eating whole foods, working on your physical fitness, having fitness goals that get you excited, that are fun to engage in and that you can do every single day. There are studies that show us that exercise consistently done can be just as effective or more effective than pharmaceuticals at treating depression. When our body is healthy, it frees up our mind to be healthy. People can train their minds as well. Meditation can be incredibly powerful in allowing us to have greater control over our mind, over our thoughts, over our feelings, and ultimately over our actions. The mind is a muscle and the brain is a muscle as much as the biceps. And if we train it properly, then it can become stronger and do things that we couldn't do before. Mindfulness meditation, which is often simply the act of sitting in the moment and being present with yourself and being aware of what thoughts go through your mind and recognizing those thoughts but not getting lost in them. Knowing that those thoughts don't determine who you are, those urges don't determine who you are. They're just fleeting moments in your mind. You can observe those and watch them exit your mind just as you watch them enter. Sitting and doing this five or ten minutes a day or even practicing it while doing something else like washing dishes and focusing entirely on that act, being present with that moment, washing each dish to your best ability and recognizing when your mind starts to wander or you think about past regrets or future worries or temptations to engage in activities you don't want to engage in. You can simply recall your mind back to the present moment and each time you do that, it's like a rep of an exercise. And your mind and your willpower will become stronger by doing so. Another thing that many people find is incredibly helpful is finding purpose in their lives. Is their occupation something that fulfills them? Do they feel like they're making a difference? Do they feel challenged? Do they feel like they can grow in that position and make a difference in the world and help other people? If you can't find that in your job or your employment, you need to work a certain job for money. I totally understand that. I've been there myself, as have many of us. But we all need to feel like we are contributing to the world, like we're having a positive impact. So find a way to do that. Volunteer with an organization you're passionate about. 
um, join a group that is committed to volunteering and making the world a better place. Whatever skills you have, employ those in the service of others. Or simply think in each day, how can I help someone in my life today? Can I do something nice for someone? Can I recognize uh, the beauty in another person and give them a compliment? Uh, can I compliment their energy or their persistence or their work ethic or how much care and attention they put into their lives in various ways? Can I make someone's day a little bit brighter today? Getting outside of ourselves and thinking more about others and what we can do for them can actually, ironically, help us grow and help us live richer and happier lives. Like I was saying before, we're social creatures and part of being a social creature is contributing to the group and that can give us a lot of purpose. We can develop our spirituality when we feel a sense of connection with the divine or the greater powers in the universe. It can allow us to surrender control and know that as long as we try our best, we can have faith that things will work out. We don't need to know everything. We don't need to control everything. If we have that connection to the greater universe and we feel a part of something bigger than ourselves, then even when times are difficult and we feel alone, that can give us the strength that we need to keep moving forward. And whether that is on a formal religious level, which is something that Matt Frad could probably tell you more about than I could, or on a more personal, spiritual level, developing this sense of connection can be tremendously powerful. What else can we do to create a more healthy life? What are some of the common holes that people have? Well, I believe that if we're not growing stronger, then we're getting weaker and we're dying, really. We're decomposing. So we have to have goals that we can work toward every day that make us feel like we're growing stronger physically or we're growing more intelligent, we're growing more mindful and aware or knowledgeable about the world. We're developing skills. So if you have goals like this, even something as simple as developing a fun little skill like juggling, this can give you something to look forward to, something to practice when you don't feel like working or when you need a break, something that you can see develop day after day and give you a sense of accomplishment. When we feel this way, we don't want to do anything that would sabotage or sacrifice that feeling. These are activities that, after we engage in them, leave us feeling better. We feel proud. We feel like we're growing and we're accomplishing things. And they don't drain us. They don't leave us feeling empty. They don't leave us regretful, remorseful, uh, wishing that we could go back and change things. When we leave behind this digital world that we've come to use as an escapist crutch for our emotions, the real world can open up to us. The world is truly open and free, and we can all decide what our goals are, what we would like to accomplish and develop in our own lives. The key is to start doing it. You don't have to know exactly what kind of life you want to build right now, but the key is to start. Start trying, start experimenting, start adding things into your life that you think are missing. At first, it might feel challenging, but as time goes on, you get more comfortable with your new life and start building a life that you can look forward to every day when you wake up, you'll start to realize that you're giving porn fewer and fewer of your thoughts and that the urges and temptations are fewer and farther between. But in the end, no matter how great of a life we build, I'll be honest here, there are always going to be dark and difficult times. I've seen many a rebooter, a recovering porn addict, go months or even years away from pornography, and then encounter something difficult. Maybe a relationship ends. Maybe a marriage ends. Maybe there's a death in the family or they lose a job. And in this moment of pain, because they didn't develop other healthy ways of coping with this big of a, a hit to their emotional selves, they can go back to porn because that is what they reinforced for years as promising relief in times of pain. So in addition to building up a great, fulfilling, connected life, we need ways to cope with pain when it does come. Healthy ways that leave us actually feeling better than worse after we engage in them. Think about what that could be for you. It might be when you're having a hard time, you turn to a friend or a family member whom you can always talk to. Or it might be a journal. Perhaps every time you're feeling in pain, you open up your journal and start to write 
and get all your feelings out that way. Perhaps you're an exercise aficionado, and what makes you feel better always is getting out into nature or into the gym and working your body and working out your emotions that way. Have a repertoire of these activities that you can engage in that make you feel better when you're feeling bad or when you're feeling depressed or lonely. And have these prepared for yourself. Have these in mind or even keep a list in your office or your bedroom of these activities so that when you are feeling bad, you know there's other ways out. There's other ways you can make yourselves feel better than using porn. I think we've reached a good endpoint for today's episode, my first episode. Thank you so much for joining me, for listening. I hope that you walk away a bit better informed. Maybe you understand yourself or maybe you understand the struggles of a loved one with pornography a little bit better. At this point, I'd like to invite you to join the Love People Use Things campaign by supporting us on Patreon. Patreon, if you're not familiar with it, is a platform that allows people to support the creators and the content that they really believe in. You can make a monthly pledge there for as little as $1 a month, and that helps us not only financially to practically be able to keep making these episodes, but it also tells us that we are adding value to people's lives out there, that people believe in this and that it is helping, it is making a difference. And that is inspiring for us. That keeps us going. That keeps us spreading this message and trying to help people understand pornography addiction and pornography's role in our lives and how to build a better life free from that pornography. As an example, we have rewards. And if you support us for $10 a month, we're going to send you some gifts in return. You're going to get Matt Frad's book, The Porn Myth, Exposing the Reality Behind the Fantasy of Pornography. In addition, you're also going to get another book, Equipped, Smart Parenting in a Sexualized World by Amanda Zerfus, and one month free of Covenant Eyes, an accountability and internet filtering software, my favorite, the one I always recommend to people, a 3x3 three three Love People Use Things sticker, 25% off a Love People Use Things t-shirt, and access to free live stream events for men, for, for women, for both men and women, and finally for parents. To support us, just go to lovepeopleusethings.fm and click support. Thank you so much. We really, really appreciate it. And thank you to all of our current patrons. My name is Noah Church. You'll be hearing from me again soon. If you're interested to find more work from me, you can visit my YouTube channel, Noah B.E. Church, or go to my website, addictedtointernetporn.com, where you can also find ways to work with me if you're looking for personal guidance. I wish you all a wonderful pornography-free day, and I'll see you again soon.